Eric Robertson, Global Head of Research and Chief Strategist at Standard Charter, joins us around the set now with more. Um, Eric, thanks for being with us. Thank Before you. we get on to your LATAM call, which I think is quite interesting, and I'm keen to, um, to bring it up, do you think the U.S. can withstand more tightening from the Federal Reserve, or is the Fed at risk of over-tightening? I think that's a really important question for, for the second half of the year. I think one of the challenges that we have you know, yet to face is this cumulative impact of monetary tightening. And let's remember that historically, this is not just the Fed that's been hiking. It's nearly all central banks Eric, around the world. Just, um, Eric, uh, let me just pick up where we left off around the uh, capacity of the UK, uh, the U.S. economy to cope with further tightening from the Fed. Yeah, and, and I think it applies to the UK as well, right? I mean, we have seen an unprecedented monetary hiking cycle over the last 18 months from virtually all central banks around the world. I don't think the impact of that tightening has played out. So we see quite a, a pronounced slowing in, in developed market uh, economies in the second half of this year and into next year. Now, in the report that you've recently published, you say while inflation remains sticky in several major economies, the data from LATAM may offer hope. Elaborate. So if, it's interesting, if you look back, coming out of the COVID crisis, LATAM economies were among the first to see this inflation surge. And what's interesting as well is that the central banks there were the first to catch on to this. They delivered a fairly aggressive and preemptive rate hiking cycle. And we're already seeing the impact of inflation in many of their economies come down. So if LATAM was a, a precursor for the global cycle on the way up, there's a very good chance that it says the same thing on the way back down. What about China in this mix as we talk about emerging markets because it was an area where the market thought would be reopening, rebounding, it would be a great play for the first half. It simply just has not been and there's been fading optimism to the point where you've seen that there's been net selling uh, 300 million worth of funds uh, in the second quarter have been stripped out of Chinese markets. Does it bounce back? Does it to fare a little bit better in the second half? I think the pendulum of sentiment on China has swung to both ends of the extremes, right? In the first quarter, we had this amazing optimism about the reopening, as you described. The economic momentum has slowed in the second quarter. There's no disputing that, and that's left quite a bit of, of disappointment. I think the reality is that the balance of the year, you'll see growth in China around the mid-fives. We expect 5.4% growth for the full year. And I do expect some capital to come back as that sentiment stabilizes. But I think the key factor is that there are a number of external factors, whether it's the slowdown in the West that could affect China's exports, geopolitical tensions as well. So it will be a, a lackluster Recovery, you touched you on geopolitical tensions and we've been taking some live pictures all morning from Vilnius. We still have President Joe Biden on the ground. For a lot of people, this has been the read across. It's not just about Russia, Ukraine. It's about China, too, and the signaling function. Just flesh it out for us when it comes to how you're thinking about the geopolitics around China. I think today it is, it is safe to say that the, the interlocked nature of geopolitics and economics has never been stronger. Right? We see that with the U.S.-China trade wars. We see that with the geopolitical tensions between Russia and Ukraine. And I think there's a desire amongst people to try and create this very binary world. It's, it's U.S. versus China. We don't think it's that simple. We're seeing a significant shift in trade corridors as a result of supply chain diversification. Some of that is geopolitics, but some of that is just good economics. And I think that that is in some ways not appreciated by the global marketplace. So as we take it to today's conversation, how do we think about Turkey putting out there again that it wants European membership? Is this about alliances economically? Is it seeing that we're reshaping the world based on these alliances? And they're saying, look, hey, I want back in now when it comes to Europe. I think that that is a hope that has never been lost in Turkey, right? To be a part of that broader economic region. We are seeing shifts in, let's call it, global supply chains. For example, we've seen a massive shift towards uh, Middle East to Asia trade corridors. And Turkey sits at the nexus of that. And I think Turkey rightfully observes that if they can position themselves as a part of this key trade block between Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, I think that positions themselves well economically. Let me ask you about the dollar, um, taking into account all of the geopolitical uh, uncertainty that remains. The euro dollar trade has been pretty range bound throughout the year, despite all of the uncertainty from both the macro and geopolitical perspective. What could cause it to break out of its current trading range? Well, look, there's, a, there's an interesting story uh, in the background of what you've just described, which is this de-dollarization story. Now, we've argued a couple of times in our reports that 
we are cyclically bearish on the U.S. dollar, which is a fancy way of saying that we think the dollar goes down for economic reasons. But the structural demise of the dollar for geopolitical reasons or other reasons we think is, is overstated. And the euro plays, again, in, in the sweet spot of that story. The ECB is continuing to hike rates. The European economy is struggling. But I do think the euro has some potential here. Uh, Eric, just to pick up on the conversation, we have been talking about alliances being reshaped. The geopolitics are huge, and this is a very big moment on the ground where we're seeing that play out. But I think a lot of economists, too, have been working out that, look, structurally, things are changing. We've just gone through a corporate cycle of peak profit margins, some of that down to the post-COVID demand story, some of it down to greedflation. But now we've got another problem, and that is the structural shift where we want to see reshoring, homeshoring, nearshoring. How do you think this plays out when it comes to profitability? Are we in that window where it's starting to bite already? It's a transition period, right? Which is a, a polite way of saying it's going to be a little bit bumpy. Uh, if you look at just at our growth forecast for the next two years, we see global growth at, at sub 3%, right? That's not fantastic. There's not a lot of buffer for things to go wrong. But under the surface, there's some good stories, right? ASEAN is a very powerful growth engine in the global economy at the moment, the Middle East as well. Um, and as we talked about earlier, LATAM is a really interesting story because the central banks, in our opinion, are going to start to take away some of that restrictive monetary policy. So we're seeing some of those shifts. But as you described, that transition is, is, is challenging. We haven't mentioned India directly here. I mean, the, the opposite story from China, where China, everybody was optimistic and then suddenly became somewhat pessimistic. India, everybody was pessimistic at the start on the back of the Adani story that uh, was unfolding. And now they're more optimistic thanks to the uh, reshoring, homeshoring, friendshoring story. How does India feature on your radar on the geopolitics? Well, look, from, a, from an economic point of view, here's the great thing. E India is going to be the fastest growing large economy this year. We're expecting growth above 6%. We are seeing significant FDI back into India. We're seeing very strong private and public sector capex. These are all very, very good stories. And I think what it allows India to do is to play a very neutral role in the geopolitics. They have to keep negotiations on both sides of the equation, but their economic strength, I think, will work very, very well for them. What do you think about the Japanese market? We've had a lot of uh, foreign inflows into the market this year, the Nikkei 225 at a three-decade high. We know a lot of that has come on the back of Warren Buffett's investments in the country, but also the macro picture has been improving, and they've had some pretty significant corporate reforms pushed through. What's the outlook for H2 in your view? Look, we have to remember one really critical factor for Japan, which is that the Bank of Japan is keeping monetary policy at a level of easing that is, you know, some would argue, and I think correctly, that is inappropriate for the recovery and the strength of the economy. Investors, I think, have correctly played on this fact of a, of a weakening currency, stronger domestic profit growth, and a little bit of inflation for the first time in decades. So the key question in our mind for the second half of the year is, does the Bank of Japan start to reverse that easy policy? If you do see that, we do think there's a risk of yen strengthening. That may take some of the air out of the Nikkei balloon. So I think we're a little bit more cautious in the second half. Eric, thank you very much for joining us to talk us through so markets in the second half and uh, being so patient with all the live unfolding events taking place. Eric Robertson with us, Global Head of Research and Chief Strategist Standard Chartered.